We all want love, but most of us don't want to date to get it. Because let's be honest, dating kind of sucks. But maybe it doesn't have to if we actually know what we're doing. Hi, I'm Kira Saban, and this is Reinventing Dating, a smart and sweary podcast for all singles to learn the mindsets and skills to date with intention and confidence. Join me weekly as I break down the science and psychology behind what's working in our dating culture and what isn't. Every week I bring a new topic, trend, skill, or mindset that can help us get out of our own way to learn how to date for relationships that we actually want. Because love isn't broken, but dating kind of is. But I'm reinventing it. Let's do this. Well, hello there, sugar pants. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. I hope that this new year has brought a ton of happiness and joy to you already. Welcome to a new series here on the podcast and our series is going to be common dating questions through a modern and healthy dating perspective. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about that all in just a moment but I have a couple of quick announcements that I want to share with everybody. Number one, I am doing a free letting go of 2023 and setting intentions for the new year of 2024 workshop on this Sunday, the 7th of January, 2024, 2 p.m. Eastern time. If you would like to join me, head over to learn.reinventingdating.com. The information is there. You can sign up. It's absolutely free. You don't have to be on camera. You don't have to actually do much at all. It's just there to have some reflection, to let go of some things, to celebrate, and to bring in the new year with some intention. It's going to be great. Come join me. Check it out at learn.reinventingdating.com. Next I'm looking for a co-host. So I'm going to be bringing back a podcast that I did in 2020, but had to end due to just timing and COVID and and some other things. But I am looking for a co-host for the podcast. Is it you? Let's find out. Let's talk about it. I have no idea. If this person should be a fellow coach or expert, someone who's just really funny, a great interviewer, a pop culture junkie. So I'm basically just spreading it and sharing it to see if it sparks someone's interest and to go from there. Now, a few things. This would be a podcast that focuses on love, dating, and relationships through the lens of media. So we will be watching rom-coms and then breaking them down as well as some short limited series TV shows. You will need three to four hours a week to do this. And what that looks like is you need to have the time to watch the movie, critically look at it, and then record the episode. You must obviously be a square bear or okay with swearing because that will be a thing. (laughs) And I'm looking for someone who just loves movies and TV shows as much as I do and just can't shut up about them. Now, if you're interested whatsoever, I am opening this up for everyone, whether you are uh, female, male, non-binary, straight, queer, single, married, whoever. I have no idea who the right co-host would be. So I'm opening this up and I'm just starting it with a very basic info form for you to answer some questions. I already have Almost 30 people have applied in like less than a day, which is fun and awesome and exciting. But if you think it's a good match for you or you know somebody who would love something like that, go ahead and head over to cohost.reinventingdating.com. There's a type form there for you to fill out. It'll take you less than 10 minutes. And I hope it's going to be pretty fucking exciting. Finally, I'm going to be adding some one day and weekend workshops to reinventing dating throughout the year. And our first one is live and it's dating as an anxious attachment style. It's an online weekend workshop. It's live. It's small group. It's less than 15 people. 
And the goal is to stop feeling clingy and needy and insecure while dating and learn how to get calm, clear, and ask for what you need. It's January 27th and 28th, 2024. It's 11 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern, both days. And you can sign up at anxious.reinventingdating.com. But I want to talk a little bit about this. And I also want to say this is pretty new for me. And one of the things that I may be learning about myself or that I can do better is giving people more time to sign up for something. I have a great idea and then I'm like, oh, I should do that. I have that weekend free. Maybe that's a great weekend. And then I find out that a lot of people already have plans. So if you are listening to this and you think that this would be great for you, but you cannot make January 27th and 28th, please reach out to me, Kira at reinventingdating.com. Let me know you're interested in the for the future. And A, I'll be definitely running this again. And I might just move it back to February or March to so it's a little bit easier for people to join. But a lot of people that I know or I talk to don't actually know a ton about attachment styles. Some somebody recently told me, like, oh yeah, I've heard of dating through like attachment theory, like it's a way of dating. And that's not the way that I feel about it at all. And in fact, I did a whole episode in season one of this podcast about attachment styles, because I think it's something that everybody should know about. You should know your attachment style. You should know who you're naturally attracted to and then how to navigate it. And it's not easy if you have been dating with this attachment style for years and years you probably just think this is what you do, this is your personality, and it's actually not. So just a couple of things to see if you are an anxious attachment style like me, because I am, and how you would know. So here's the first thing I'm going to ask you. Does dating make you feel a little crazy? If it does, I absolutely get it for years. I cried to my friends that I did not know if love was out there for me. Because I always seemed to love harder than the people I was dating, which also left me feeling constantly disappointed, frustrated, and alone, which is the opposite of what I was trying to be. I felt like I was always the one doing all of the work. I was pulling people along. I was overcompensating, overthinking, making sure they were comfortable while I was just trying not to lose my shit half the time. I was pretty much begging and hustling for love, and it sucked. But heartache after heartache, even I couldn't hide the fact that I was choosing unhealthy people in hopes that I could swoop in and help fix their lives so they would see my worth, choose me, love me, and stay forever. You guys, that's fucked up, and we do it all the time. So for me, I pretty much assumed that there was just something wrong with me and I was unlovable and I was unattractive and I just gave up. Well, for a bit I did. And then I decided I was actually going to figure out what the hell was going on because I was smart. And that's when I learned about attachment styles. Now, attachment theory has been around since like the 50s and 60s, but I think it's really come out about dating and adult relationships since about 2009 through 2010. So it's fairly new. And if you're not really in this realm, or maybe you're newly single or newly divorced, you probably don't know about that. And that makes sense. But when I found out about it, it's my mind was blown. The stars aligned, the, you know, everything all of a sudden made sense, like why I was always worried that they were going to leave, why I would lose my shit waiting for texts or calls why I always felt like I loved them or liked them more than they liked me, and why I was a reasonably normal and stable person most of the time until I started liking someone and then all bets were off. Who gets me? But once I understood how my anxious attachment style was sabotaging the fuck out of me because it was, I was able to get out of my own way and then, as you guys know, create a super healthy and happy relationship with Danny which is amazing. So a couple of things to check to see if you are an anxious attachment style. Have you ever been guilty of calling or texting your partner repeatedly until they respond, frequently checking on social media for information on them? What are they doing? Where are they at? Why are they not getting back to you? 
feeling suspicious when everything is calm, having a hard time saying no, even when you feel like you should, repeatedly asking your partner if they find you attractive or if they still like you. Next, are you even guilty of trying to avoid breaking up at all costs, even when the relationship doesn't feel good or is healthy? And by the way, all of that's unhealthy as shit and not going to get you love at all. So finally, ask yourself how much easier dating would feel if you knew exactly what to ask for to create a relationship so you don't have to wonder if you're being too much or too needy. If you knew how to calm yourself so that you don't sabotage it by getting demanding or clingy or lashing out, because that's what would happen to me, I would be okay and bend over backwards for a while, maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe months. And then finally, I would get resentful and angry and sometimes mean. Yet I was the one never asking them for what I needed. And then finally, how good would it feel to have strategies in your back pocket to choose wisely, ask for what you need, and even have the toughest dating conversations? That's what we are going to do. This is for anybody, women or men, however you identify. And it's going to be a small group up to 15 people. It's a two-day live online interactive workshop with me personally. You will need to be there. You will be on camera some of the time. We will be interacting. We will be having conversations. This isn't just something you can just actively check out of. I want you to learn this shit. And then finally, once again, it is Saturday and Sunday, January 27th and 28th from 11 a.m. Eastern to 4.30 p.m. Eastern on both days. And it re you also get an easy-to-use private portal that will have the pre-work and recording and some bonuses. All of my shit's pretty fun. Like, I do a lot with TV shows and movies to give examples of what I'm teaching. I have science-backed info. There will be activities. There will be Q&A. There will be discussions. And there will be the dating as an anxious attachment style Jeopardy game show. And then finally, with all of my stuff, you always get resources to take with you. Scripts, questions, strategies, templates, so that you know what to look for, what to ask, and how to spot people who are actually available. After the workshop, you will know the difference between wants, needs, and neediness, so you know it's fair to ask for in a new relationship. Have scripts and strategies to be able to ask for what you need and set basic boundaries. Know how to spot unavailable people so you can walk away before getting attached and getting too far in. And then learning healthy coping and self-soothing techniques to calm yourself to make clear and smart decisions. Because boy, did I not have those for a lot of years. Guys, there is a ton of information. I've created a really fun info page. You can find it at anxious.com reinventingdating.com. And guys, I'm keeping this really, you know, inflation is real. I get it. We've all been kind of struggling through 2023. So you can either pay in full for $2.99 or there's a two-part payment plan that are 30 days apart for $150. So check it out, anxious.reinventingdating.com. And if you know that you want to do this and you can't do it that weekend, reach out to me and let me know because then I'll be able to know when to schedule it in the future. So let's get into our new series and our new topic today. The new series is going to be common dating questions through a modern and healthy dating perspective. Now, a few things to keep in mind about this series. I'm going to be asking some of the questions I get asked the most, which I think are questions that I hear in the dating atmosphere a lot. But bringing them here and talking about them through a more modern, non-genderal, healthy, science-backed, psychology-backed perspective. So a few things to keep in mind about this series. This is about finding a partner. I'm always wanting people to be looking for partner behavior rather than just catching feelings. It's not about finding a date or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Everything I talk about is about partnerships, not just relationships, and both people being present, giving to the relationships, bringing things to the relationships. That's what I see works. 
That's what I've seen work in my relationship. That's what I've seen work in my clients' relationships. And that's what I think is the future of relationships, not these old school gender roles and traditions that don't actually have any basis in anything smart whatsoever. Next, this is not about traditions or how we have done things forever. This is about setting every single dating situation up for the best chance of success possible. That's always my goal with everything I do. When I say to somebody, you know, go slow, that might feel weird. That might feel different than anything they've ever done. But I'm always trying to set people up for the best chance of success because I believe truly that there's a lot of people that we could date. But we get in our own way. We get in our own head about it. We bring along our baggage and then we kind of, you know, freak out, get confused, shut down, fight, flight, whatever, and then we're out. So everything that I'm talking about is how to set these situations up for the best chance of success possible. Number three, if you disagree with something, that's cool, but ask yourself why. Is that what you've learned? Is that what you've just known? Has it worked well so far for you? Is it healthy? Is it actually getting you what you want? I am amazed by the amount of empowered women and men that I talk to who say they want a relationship. And when I ask them basic questions such as, who's a good match for you? What are you looking for? Do you know how to spot those qualities on dates? What questions do you ask? They come up deer in headlights, blank face. Please know. There is a shit ton of work that you can be doing while you're single to set yourself up and your future relationship for much better success. We don't have to be in a relationship to work on relationship skills. If you are a human on this earth that lives in some level of community, meaning with other people, you go to work, you have friendships, then you know how to have relationships. And we have to make sure that we are doing it smartly and thoughtfully. And finally, anything that I'm sharing is not just going to be some off the cuff opinion. This isn't like what your Aunt Rita would share with you about her life stories. This isn't about what your best friend would share with you. This is actually backed in science and psychology with research, with a splash of my own experiences and experiences I have seen work with my clients. So everything I'm going to be talking for this is going to be about the future of dating, because I don't know if you caught it over here, but we're reinventing it. That's why it's called that in the podcast. And now my brand, because what we're doing right now isn't really working. And if it isn't working, we don't get love. And when we have a whole population who doesn't feel loved, in creeps loneliness, in creeps fear, in creeps hate, and every fucking thing else, depression, anxiety. So I am here to set us up for the best chance of success. This is about two people learning about each other, building something, not holding on to this is what men should do, this is what women should do. That doesn't really exist anymore. And that is fucking helping zero. No one is benefiting from old school gender roles, not women, not men, and not anybody else. Because I will be honest that in 15 years of doing this, one of the most fascinating things I have seen in the dating industry is how little critical thought we have about dating. Does this make sense? Is the way I'm dating me getting into relationships I want? Do I know who is a good match for me? I am pretty blown away at the fact that we have invented flying cars. Google it if you don't believe me. But really do not put a thought, ton of thought or preparation in picking our fucking life partner. So let's go in to the topic today. One of the biggest questions that I hear and that I have a lot of personal experience with, good and not so good, is do long distance relationships work? So today I'm going to break down my own personal experiences of long distance relationships and why they did or didn't work for me. Reasons why we might be choosing long distance relationships that may not be as healthy as we think. Things to watch out for if you are having a long distance relationship. 
to stay safe and smart. And then finally, if you are in one or want to have one, how to set it up once again for the best chance of success. Now, through the years, I have been asked a lot about long distance relationships. Do they work? Is it worth it? How do we set them up? So let's start with my big old confession, which is I have had a shit ton of long distance relationships in my past. In fact, that was majority of my dating and relationships. Truthfully, Danny was one of the very first long, non long distance relationships. And I think that's one of the reasons that it actually worked for me. But let's start a little bit with my history of long distance. My first long distance relationship was in high school. That's right. Kind of the my first quote unquote, you know, falling in love experience. He lived in Arkansas, by the way, and my parents hated me for a year of my life because I know the youngins or our even some of our young millennials may not know about this, but in the late 80s, there was no internet, there was no computers. I actually remember at the time thinking, what if in my lifetime we were able to make video calls? I'm like, oh my God, wouldn't that be amazing? I really didn't realistically think that was ever going to happen. So it continues to blow my mind. The first time I saw Skype, the first time that, you know, that I started seeing FaceTime and stuff, I was like, whoa, 16 and 17 year old Kira would have lost her mind about this. But I pushed up our long distance bills that there was a couple of bills over $300, which at the time, like in 1989 and 90, my parents, oh my God, they did not like me. They were so angry at me. I actually had to get a job to pay them off, but I was young and in love. And so we would sneak calls late at night, talking to each other on our phones that were connected to the wall because the Sabins couldn't afford the newfangled cordless phones. And I loved his little Southern accent and everything else. And although it didn't work out because we were 16 and living in different states, that was the start of probably 25 years of mostly long distance relationships. And here's a few things that I realized about myself and why I was constantly choosing long distance relationships that maybe will resonate with you. The first reasons when I got very real with myself and started doing some work is the reason I chose long distance relationships was that they were comfortable for me. They felt in my comfort zone. I learned pretty quickly, first through phone calls, but even through video calls, that it was really easy to show up and be great for somebody for a couple hours or a day or maybe even a weekend and then go back to my normal life. Go back to hanging out with my friends, going back to all the things that I want to do, things that lit me up without them getting in the way. You feel like you get to have the best of somebody and you get to think about them and you get to think about them thinking about you and you get to connect over things like FaceTime or Skype and Zoom where I can put myself in my best lighting and show only the parts of my body that I really wanted to show and texting. But the thing is, is at that point in my life, whether it was, it felt emotionally easier. They didn't have to see me on my shitty days. I could pretend to kind of be perfect or really great or awesome and low maintenance and breezy. I could pretend to have my shit together, although I totally did not. I could pretend lots of things because when somebody is hours or even time zones away, you can kind of be whoever you want to be. And I loved that. I would talk to them at night or see them once a month. And then it was really romantic. And we would have these awesome days together or an incredible weekend. But here's the kicker. It felt good to me because I never had to get vulnerable. They weren't there on the day to day. And when my life would blow up, which it would, I would have something happen at work that sucked or maybe friendship that wasn't going that well or 
money problems or, you know, because I was young and had jobs that didn't pay much. I didn't have to share it if I didn't want to. They weren't there when I had a bad day to see my struggles. They got to see mostly just the good stuff because that's what I wanted them to see. The truth about why I was choosing long distance relationships was because I didn't have to fully let them in. It was a way for me to pretend I was having a relationship, but also be able to keep my wall up because they only knew what I wanted them to know. And I only knew what they wanted to tell me. Because one thing I learned the hard way more than once was that long distance relationships, even though you might be talking or texting or FaceTiming daily, you're not seeing them on the day to day to know who they truly are and vice versa. And Maybe you're like, Kira, that's the fucking point. I don't know if I want to let somebody into my life. I don't know if I want to see somebody on the day to day. Maybe I'm really okay with my normal life and would just like somebody who just pops in occasionally. All right. I think you know, and hopefully if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know that I'm never going to tell people what relationship to have or how to have it. But I am going to say that if you're looking for a certain type of relationship, like a long-term monogamous relationship, there are things that are going to be healthy and helpful to that. And there are things that are not. And here is a reminder that it took me a long time to get to. Real love love that lasts, love that keeps going, love that evolves past the tough time, happens through the vulnerabilities of the day-to-day. Real love and true love shows up in a deep connection and intimacy that goes with the ups and downs of day-to-day life. Through many years of this relationship that I've had with Danny now, this has come up about how hard it is to sometimes share my truth as an anxious attachment style and because I was so nervous about being real, being myself, sharing all of my stuff because I had learned that my imperfections were unlovable. That's another podcast. That's another day. But it has been a growing pain for me to notice that I'm either withholding information or not wanting to share things with Danny because I view them as imperfections. And I've had to work through that and get the fuck over it. There are still things nine years in that are occasionally embarrassing me to admit or show. In all honesty, over the Christmas break, there was a moment where I broke down crying. And I've told no one ever. And it took me until about two weeks ago to tell Danny, my fucking husband, and the person I have been with now for nine years. Luckily, he keeps me in check, and I have to remind myself, and sometimes he reminds me too, that he's my best friend, my biggest cheerleader, and I share all parts of me. And I encourage him to share all parts of him. Because that's where love is. That's where love exists. And that's how you build intimacy, connection, and a relationship. And one of the greatest things over the years he's ever told me, and has said it numerous times that's made me feel so good, is that when I share my faults, my poor coping strategies or mechanisms, my trauma responses, all of the things, he says, thank you for showing me another way to be great for you, to love you, to show up for you, so that I can love you better. And that shit matters. That's the shit we're looking for. So I'm kind of throwing it down for you here, guys. But when you're in a real relationship, it can't be just the good stuff. It can't be just the shiny. It can't be only the good things. Because not only is that not real, that doesn't create long-lasting love. And the thing is, is this kind of vulnerability, this kind of intimacy and connection couldn't really happen in the long distance relationships I was having, because I could remain kind of protected. I could continue having a wall up, whether it looks like it or felt like it. But when we protect ourselves from pain, we also protect ourselves from love. And what feels comical to me now is 
how I remember saying over and over again that there's just nobody in my area I want to date. But if I'm honest with myself, that's not true. I know for a fact now doing this work that Madison, the place I have lived on and off since 1998, has been named the number one small city for singles over 35. I also know that after talking to thousands of singles over the last 15 years, that the Midwest, where I'm from and where I've chosen to live most of my time, tends to be better dating for long-term relationships because it's very much a part of the culture and value system here. Now, that's not true of everywhere. But it is highly expected that by your mid-late 20s that you're probably going to find a person and settle down and have a family and buy a house. There's a lot of old school traditional, and I'm not saying that those are a bad thing whatsoever, but that's very much the norm in the Midwest. So me not finding people or having people to date wasn't really true. I also didn't try that hard. I'll be honest, I did not try that hard at all. Besides regularly declaring dramatically that, you know, I was open to love if somebody showed up if, or I was open to dating if somebody showed up. I didn't actually try. Besides some drunken makeouts, we know I love a good dumpster out back. I don't like to bring people home. I don't like to go to their places. That's unsafe. I also don't, don't want to put myself in a situation that was unsafe. So we would make out back where there's tended to be a lot of dumpsters. I like to call it dumpster love. In fact, Danny, my husband and I made out by a dumpster the first night. This is a truth. But I wasn't really trying to date. I didn't let people know I was really looking. I was usually went after people who were kind of too young or once again, not in my area because it kept me safe. Now, why did I personally do that? Why did I seek out long distance relationships for so long? Now, this is for me personally, but these are things that I've seen in my clients and you might resonate with. So as I've kind of talked about, I was afraid that if they saw all of me, they wouldn't like me or want to stay. Now, this is actually some self-worth stuff as well as anxious attachment style issue. Next, it was convenient and felt easier. By the way, it wasn't, but it felt easier. I never had to fully commit. I could always have one foot in and one foot out the door if I met somebody locally. It gave me some feelings and attention without having to do the hard stuff like vulnerability and letting down my thick wall that I've actually built up after years of poor choices and sad relationships, if we even want to call them that. And that was really a lot about my relationship maturity or lack thereof. I kept saying I wanted love in a real relationship, but only on my very specific terms where I could remain guarded and in my mind safe. It also allowed me to kind of feel a part of society without the work. Now, by my mid-late 20s, like I just mentioned, I was living in Madison. Most of my friends were getting into relationships. So if I was dating somebody long distance, it felt like I was that part of society. I was too dating someone. I also had a relationship, but it was just, once again, really on my terms. And it wasn't too far off from George Glass, Jan Brady's boyfriend on the Brady Bunch. Please tell me that you know that reference. And I just wrote a TikTok that I will put in the show notes that I will share about why George Glass was the best boyfriend ever, which I thought was very funny. Next, I could hide my stuff. My friends and family really didn't have to meet them. So I could hide that maybe they were only separated and not divorced, which would keep the romantic fairy tale going in my head. I could kind of keep the stories going, whether they were true or not. And then finally, another reason that I was really seeking out long distance relationships is that if it didn't work out, I had something to blame that wasn't me. I could say it was the distance. I could say they just didn't really know me or they were scared to commit or whatever. And that meant that I never had to look at my role or my contributions to why it worked or didn't work. Anybody relate to any of those? So let's move on to just a couple of concerns and challenges of long distance relationships that I don't think actually existed 20 years ago. So as a reminder, 
you couldn't really have long distance relationships very easily unless for years and years you were going to write a letter. There are people who wrote letters for a long time before they got together, in a, but that was definitely a different time. It was very hard to have a long distance relationship before really the 2000s because it was expensive. You're calling somebody long distance. That could be dollars a minute. That is real. I have spent a lot of money on long distance phone calls in my day. And it's amazing to me now that I can call people up for free or contact them for free. It's Sometimes I'm like, wow, wow. But let's talk about a couple of the other concerns and challenges of kind of modern day long distance relationships. There's a bigger chance of fraud. And I'm not just talking about online dating scams, which I brought up in my last season. But I'm talking about they may be in a relationship. They might have a family and you don't know. And how would you? I have heard this story, unfortunately, many times where somebody connects, maybe they met them at a conference, or maybe they've even known them for a long time. But because that person's long distance, that person can keep parts of their life private, quiet, unknown. And that person has put time, energy, money, so much time and energy into getting to know or possibly being with this person only to find out months and months later that person is actually not available physically or emotionally. That person may be not who they said they were. This is real. And here's what I want to say about that. That shit is hard to bounce back from. I think sometimes we get so lonely and we want somebody so badly. We just really choose unhealthy and just situations that don't make a ton of sense because we want somebody so badly. But I want you to remember that as we do that, or as we keep doing that, every single time that doesn't work out, it can take a toll. It takes a toll on our self-worth, our self-esteem. It can take a toll on our trust about who we're choosing. We can start second guessing ourselves on every decision we make. So not only is that shitty to happen in real life, it's also something that can take a while to get over. So I'm just saying, don't do that. Another concern or challenge for long distance relationship is it is hell for anxious attachment styles. You are already nervous. You're already having a hard time waiting for that text or that call. Throw someone who's maybe hours or time zones away and you are cycling between feeling good and feeling needy, and it is exhausting. You never feel stable. You never really feel safe. It might feel exciting. It might feel romantic, but you never feel really good. And if you don't feel safe or good, you can't actually create a relationship that works. Also, Long distance relationships in the modern day and age, people can hide their real stuff. Now, what I mean by that, once again, that's not just, you know, a romance scammer, but maybe they're not over their ex as much as they say. Maybe they don't have the job or the lifestyle that they're pretending to have. There's a lot of things and little white lies that people tell others so that they'll like them and that you can't really verify from far away. So you're putting, once again, that time, that energy, that effort, sometimes money and going to see them and all of the other things that you might be spending money on. And you don't actually know if they're the person that they say they are. I have known people who basically got engaged and never lived in the same city together, ever. And that their marriage lasted weeks or months. And I've heard that story more than a couple of times. So I'm not just here to scare everybody. Can they work? Of course. Absolutely. Almost any kind of relationship can work if both people are showing up, if you set it up properly. But I got to be honest, that's not what I would really suggest for people. To me, it makes the getting to really know someone process a lot longer. We're just adding in 
time and obstacles from getting to know who that person really is. But most things can work if done well. So here are some guidelines that I've created for past clients, and I'm bringing them here today for you that I hope that you use to give this, once again, the best chance of success. So the number one guideline I have for long distance relationships is you should be willing to be in each other's presence full time within a year. So let's say that you were on vacation or you went somewhere and you met somebody that you just really connect with them. And you're super excited. OK, great. Who and how are you going to get in each other's presence full time within a year, period? Because otherwise, what are you doing? I have had people in my life that I know and like who love where they live. They say, my family is here. My nieces and nephews are there. If you are dating over 35, there's a very good chance that there are exes and maybe kids involved. So you might not have the option or want to move. And that's cool. But that means that's a deal breaker for you. And you need to know that. So why get yourself in a three month or six month or even three week situation if somebody's not willing to move? It doesn't make sense. And at some point, no matter we're talking about love, we've got to add the sense back in. So my number one guideline is, and it should be a discussion pretty early on, is if you guys really like each other, how are you going to be together within a year? Because why would you be, you know, a lot longer than that in the same place so you could actually check out if this is going somewhere? The next guideline that I encourage, when you see each other, actually live. Don't just do romantic things. Don't just go to shows or concerts or go on picnics. Live. Run errands together. Do laundry. Cook together. Do activity dates. Watch and observe behaviors. One of the biggest issues I've seen with long distance is you get wrapped up in the stories that you tell each other, but not the truth of who we are day to day. You are probably going to find annoying things about them that you never saw show up over the phone or over FaceTime. And I recently heard a couple different versions of this quote, but from what I can tell, the earliest version is from Rita Mae Brown, and it goes like this. People are like tea bags. You never know how strong they'll be until they're in hot water. In times of trouble, you not only discover what you truly believe, but whether or not you can act on your beliefs. And I'm going to just sidestep that a second and just say, Somebody can like the fuck out of you. Somebody can love you. Somebody can want everything with you and vice versa. You can like them. You could love them. You could want everything with them. But you're not going to know shit until real stuff shows up. What happens when you guys financially struggle? What happens when they might have a stronger connection to their family than you? What happens? When life actually shows up, which it is guaranteed to do, then what happens? Then where is the love? Then how it's strong is the relationship? That's what you need to look for. Next, the next thing, the next guideline, understand what you or your partner might be giving up to be with each other. Now, the romantic part of us thinks love is more important than our jobs, our family, our friendships, our safety of our home. But I'm going to tell you right now, it is not. If they move to be with you, there's a very good chance that they'll be starting a new job. They won't have friends in the area. They won't have a support system to lean on. And do not think that will not put a ton of pressure on you in the relationship. You will be their everything for a while. Is that okay? Is that going to feel good? Now, vice versa, if you move to be where they're at, do you have a support system? Will you have friendships? Will you have community there? And as that person is distracted by their day-to-day -day life, their jobs, their maybe family, their friends, is what you guys have enough for that to feel good and continue feeling good? What's the collaboration here? What are they going to be helping with? What are you going to be helping them with? How are you guys going to be making it easier for each other? How will you be collaborating? 
because one sh- person should not just be making all of the sacrifices because honestly up and moving for somebody else is a huge sacrifice and life change now depending on how long you've been in your place or what kind of community and life you already have one person's love is really hard to uproot your whole life and entire world for so just be very aware of that finally number four understand what your new life is going to look like is that what you want what do i mean by that i mean that through the years i have seen people go to a wedding or go to a vacation quote unquote fall in love with somebody start dating them they spend a weekends together here they're getting to know each other they're talking on a daily basis they're excited and they are ready to make it a relationship and when we start talking about that when we start saying okay so if you move there what is your life going to look like i have seen women who lived in a major city had incredible community had a lot of family around up and moved to a small town to be a stepmom or stepdad and man that is a huge life change so when you get past those really bubbly exciting feelings that you're having will this new life that you guys are building do you want to be a step parent have you met their ex because that person's now going to also be a part of your life forever is the life that you are moving towards besides just the relationship with your potential partner a life that you're looking for do you want to live in this area does that area share your values Does it offer things that you love to do? Does it offer community? Because if it doesn't, this should be a much bigger conversation. And here is what I am going to say. My final thoughts on long distance relationships. Once again, can they work? Absolutely. Do they make things harder? Absolutely. Getting into relationships with people long distance that are going to take a lot longer to figure out if that person's actually a great match for you understand that this is possible but understand that you have just made this harder and it's going to take longer to get to know this person it's going to take longer to find out how you really work together and that's not bad it just is but do understand that if for some reason you're having a hard time dating somebody locally i want you to look at that i want you to look at your fears there our ideal and what i truly believe what creates relationships that create love every day is to be in someone's presence on a regular basis and go slowly and build. And that's just really hard to do long distance. It's not impossible, but it's hard to do. And since I don't personally believe in the one, there are going to be a lot of people who probably live a lot closer to you that you can date and build a relationship with. And I've said it once and you can go, Listen to the podcast on love, but love is just an emotion. It is one emotion and it can be received from lots of different people. And before you uproot your life and move somewhere for somebody else, don't put your blinders on so much thinking this is going to obviously work out because of how much you love each other, that you are not aware of the new life and situation you're putting yourself in or vice versa. That is the reality of long distance relationships. So did that help? I sure hope so. That's it for today, guys. If you're ready to work on your anxious attachment style, definitely check out my workshop at the end of the month. And if maybe you want to be a co-host, check that out too. All of the information will be on the Reinventing Dating website as well as right here in the information in the show notes. Here are some great questions and topics that are coming up in the new Common Dating Questions Through a Modern and Healthy Dating Perspective series. Next, is age just a number? Who should pay on first dates? Is chivalry dead? How to meet people in real life? Should you stay friends with an ex? The great eight questions that I think everybody should be asking before dates. So many good topics. I think you guys are really going to love it. All right, guys, that is it for today. Wow, huh? 
That is a lot of information. Listen to it again. But more importantly, share this everywhere. If you're not yet, come on over, follow me on Instagram, follow me on TikTok. I'm also on Facebook. If you love it, subscribe, leave a review. I'll be here next week, but until then, meet love halfway. <laughs>